Welcome in, folks. Ooh, baby, we got a good one here today. This is a little bit of a beast, okay? NVIDIA CEO was on Squawk on the Street this morning. I want to go ahead and play the interview where he speaks about the market opportunity, a lot of what's going on with NVIDIA. Obviously, this week, uh, NVIDIA is very much in focus, okay? Then we're going to go ahead and get into this one, why NVIDIA stock is trading lower. That should be an interesting one to get into. Then we're going to get into this one. NVIDIA un unveils a new Blackwell chip. Here's what to know. I think this is very important. Everybody understands exactly what's going on here so folks can understand the opportunity here okay and then the last one i want to get into is a little bit more of a you know macro kind of related one tremendous amount of cash on the sidelines so looking forward to getting into that one here today appreciate everybody joining me as always i just want to get straight in this folks smash that thumbs up make sure you're subscribed here to the channel if you don't want to smash it at least gently touch the thumbs up button okay that helps us out tremendously also got a brand new free workshop for you guys pin comment down there how much money you need to retire, quit your job, focus full time on investing, all those good subjects. That'll be pinned comment down there. Because once all these companies get involved with you, they're going to stick with NVIDIA. It's a very, very specialized way of doing computing called accelerated computing. And what would be on a communications is cares here, software developer. Yeah, this is an incredible conference. This is NVIDIA's developer conference. Everything that we do starts with software. Everything we do starts with software. That's Everything important. we do is in service of all the software developers who are solving these really difficult algorithms. We are represented by a hundred trillion dollars of industry here. Healthcare is here, financial services are here, manufacturing, industrial, automotive, climate tech, you know, holy cow, communications is here. Consumers are here. But people always think of you as and hardware. You're talking about a different platform, a yeah. system that frankly may be unassailable from competitors because once all these companies get involved with you, they're going to stick with NVIDIA. It's a very, very specialized way of doing computing called accelerated computing. This is so important right off the bat here, okay? I don't think many people understand what's actually going on with NVIDIA. They they they, <clears throat> they don't spend any time studying the company, so they like to just kind of like categorize it as like, oh, it's gone up so much, the stock price has gone up so much, it's a bubble. They don't even understand what's going on beneath the surface at NVIDIA. People are still viewing NVIDIA in a very wrong light. They're still looking at NVIDIA as it's just some company that sells chips. Big deal, okay? Listen, first off, try to make those chips and dream on about that. Secondly... Software, as Jensen spoke about here at the, the top, right? Software is what makes the magic here. And we know if you want to create a multi trillion dollar company, software is how you do it, right? Look at Mr. Softy, look at obviously Google, look at Apple, right? Software is the magic, and that's what's helped NVIDIA take things to the next level is not just their hardware chips, but also their software, how they make everything work together. And now, $4,500 a year per GPU if you want to have them be able to utilize AI from a regular GPU. We do, what we do is this, <clears throat> Jim, this is, this is the, the observation a long AI time ago. 30, 30 years ago, we observed that the CPU is really good at many things, but there are some things it's, it's surprisingly ungood at. Parallel things, things that you could distribute across a large number of processors. And so what we did was we added NVIDIA to a CPU. We connected it to a CPU, <laughs> offload, the work that the CPU is not good at. And we run that work insanely fast. Well, surprisingly, that work that the CPU is not good at represents 95% of the time that is spent in computing. We offload that 95% of the time and we run it 100 times faster. But you're talking about a total do-over of all technology. Yeah. You're talking about everything. You know, our country's building new, new plants that are using old technology, if that's the case. It's wrong. Well, we should build amazing semiconductor plants here. And we'd be more than happy to build all kinds of chips here. But it's very clear that in the future, that general purpose computing, it's like a general purpose almost anything, <clears throat> you know, general purpose uh, uh, instrument of any kind, it's not very efficient. Right. There are many types of things that we want to do very efficiently, computation of mathematics we want to do very very efficiently and so as a result of doing it efficiently you drive the cost down you use less energy one of our computers this is our latest generation this is the chip that goes into it this is the largest chip the world's ever seen this is beyond the limits of physics we had to invent some new technology to make it possible to how do many this. Is 208 billion transistors in that um 
Gosh, it's even harder. Yeah. What we're looking at. In, in yeah, in this little tiny part in the middle. And what should that cost? This this will cost, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars. And how much did you spend to develop? The very first one, the R and D budget of this generation is probably something like ten billion dollars. Ten billion, not million. Ten billion, billion dollars. And you yeah. deserve the right to be able to recoup that. Well, when you're doing it. Well, we're we're going to do our very best job. And this computer here, this computer here. And the here, name of that computer? This is Before we go further here, what he just explained there is very important, right? NVIDIA invested ridiculous sums of money to get to this point here today where they can have a chip like that, right? Now, what Jensen just took you through there, that ridiculous amount of upfront spend, it's important to understand how much this matters to NVIDIA's future when it comes to other companies. Because other companies right now, whether it be Meta, Google, Tesla, whoever, right? They're trying to get their hands on as many NVIDIA chips as possible because these chips are going to help these companies reach the opportunities five years from now, three years from now, seven years from now, 10 years from now, that are the next hundreds of billions of dollars of opportunity or trillions of dollars of opportunity. Those chips are going to help them get there. That's why these companies are willing to spend billions of dollars potentially on NVIDIA chips over the next several years or even more than that. And the reason they're willing to spend that much company by company is because they're looking at it and they're like, this is a 50 billion opportunity, 100 billion, 200 billion, 500 billion, right? We know with what NVIDIA is doing in robotics, we know a company like Tesla is going to be all over that, right? And we already know Tesla wants to get as many NVIDIA chips as possible for self-driving. So, you know, and that's just one example of one company. And then you choose not to have these chips, then you fall behind your competitors and you might not get that huge opportunity. Or instead of getting a 50% market share of some massive new market, you get 3%, you get 2%, right? Look at the cloud market. And Amazon invested before everybody, and guess what? Amazon won the biggest, right? And then Microsoft was after that, and then it was Google after that, right? And so, you know, you got to you gotta invest crazy sums of money up front. Called the Blackwell computer. This computer here has... Named after a very... Yes, a mathematician. Right. Yeah. yeah, really terrific mathematician. And, and this computer here will replace thousands of general purpose computers. This thousands. is the part that's incredible. In fact, what's amazing is that the cables of connecting last generation general purpose computers, the cables of connecting them, cost more than the price of one of these computers. The That's amount of energy that we save is incredible. Megawatts and megawatts and megawatts. Because of this, we made it possible for the computer to write software Did by itself. Did he down to 62? Wow. It is so insanely fast. Now the software can write, the, the computer can write its own software, and we call that artificial intelligence. So if that's the case, why do we still need us? Well, we still have to guide the software. We have, to, we have to create the algorithms such that the computer can go write software. And that algorithm is called deep learning. Yeah, it's re really quite a remarkable thing that, that uh, happened in the last and 12 years. And if we ask it questions, uh, we inference, yeah. it speaks our language? Well, if you ask it a question, first of all, it un not only recognizes the words, but it understands your meaning. It understands the meaning because you want. Oh, sure. You can give it a. You said, say, I would like to. First of all, I'm going to let you read this book, read Moby Dick, and then I'm going to ask you a whole bunch of questions about it. And so, first, it goes off and reads it, and it takes you know a, a flash. But of a does second. it understand why Ishmael is just completely driven by Moby Dick? Absolutely, because it saw it read the end of the story. It read the end of the story, and not only that, it's read a whole bunch of other stories. And so it understands, it understands the context of, of the conversation, but it also has encoded when, within it. You know what would be the most insane and scariest part of this is? You know what it would be? It would be a scenario where it understands sarcasm as well. Could you imagine that? Phew, if they could ever get these programs to understand, understand sarcasm as well, that would be crazy. The things crazy. that he's already read. From society. Okay, but yeah. you're describing something that's different from earnings per share. You're describing wonderment. You're you're describing it creating something that can replace trillions of dollars of what we don't need anymore. Do it faster. Do it more productively. Do it cleaner. But everything has to be replaced. There's a lot of waste in the world. 
There's a lot of waste in the world. Oftentimes we can't chase it down. Of course, there's a lot of wasted uh, energy used in, in uh, doing computing. And now with accelerated computing, we could make it a lot more efficient. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of waste uh, in, in just about every single industry. The challenge is that we've never been able to use a computer to understand the information of that industry. One of the things that's really exciting is we've been able to sequence genes, but we've never been able to understand what it means. We've been able to... So we didn't uh, understand what the proteins do? We can begin to understand what a protein does. Well, if we do that, yeah. then we can do drug trials in, in 60 days instead of six years. So, right. so companies will That's tackle right. the tough illnesses that they can't afford to tackle. That's exactly right. At the very minimum, you, know, you still have to go through trial and, and, and do trials on people and things like that. But we can reduce the time that it takes to go through the entire search space of drugs and proteins and targets. And that search space is just gigantic. It's impossible for humans to do it. We can now, because computers with artificial intelligence can understand the language of biology, we could sort through that a lot more quickly. Well, how about the last frontier? Can it understand a factory? Well, the last frontier, we have to teach it to understand physical things. It has to understand that when you drop something, it falls to the ground, but it doesn't go through the ground. Um, you have to understand mm -hmm. that, that, um, uh, that uh, mechanical hinges work in a particular way. And so this mechanical hinges work in a particular way, or the laws of physics, this is no different than word sequences and uh, sequences of sentences turn into paragraphs and so on and so forth. The computer can understand, can learn to understand physics and learn to understand mechanical things. But can it also once learn... Once it does that, then we can understand how, to how, how, a, how a factory works. Can it understand Big Mac fries, Diet Coke? <laughs> it's common sense. It's common sense. It's common sense, and therefore, uh, of course, of course, uh, if you if you order fries, you should also, you know, recommend some diet well, coke. Does it bother you that in the end we're trying to figure out whether it's a trillion dollars for Nvidia, three hundred billion for AI? My people that don't like aspartame, they would say no on the diet coke. No. Are these two pedestrian? Are these questions pedestrian versus the ten years you've worked to get here? Well, first of all, we do very different things. Okay. Um, Nvidia is a accelerated computing company. If you look at the things that we do, uh, we build the chips, the systems, the networking, and so on and so forth, the entire, the entire data center practically, all the software that goes into it. And then we sell it in parts. The reason why we sell, and that is what confuses people. They think that NVIDIA is a chip company because we sell everything in parts. Right. The reason we do that is so that our customers can integrate NVIDIA's technology into their data centers however they like. Everybody's data centers are different. Everybody's systems are different. And so when we build up the whole thing, we make it work, but we sell it in parts so that fits into the, you know, nooks and crannies, well, if, if you will. If you can break it up like that and you have the software, why would there be any other semiconductor companies? Well, there's, there's lots of, you know, Jim, the world of semiconductors is gigantic. We serve, we serve this one niche called accelerated computing and artificial intelligence. Now, this is a very important niche because it's the foundation of computing as we, we know it going forward. Right. Um, but NVIDIA is, a, NVIDIA is a data center scale company. We're a full stack software company and we design the entire computing system. We sell it in parts so that everybody can enjoy well, NVIDIA. That, when they why they do there was a little bit of a ridiculous question by Kramer there in all due respect. That was absolutely insane. Why do we need, you know, any other semiconductor companies? Like, are you kidding me? Like, NVIDIA doesn't make all the semiconductors that go inside this phone. They actually make none of the semiconductors that go inside this phone. NVIDIA is very focused on their particular space that's very different than, let's say, mobile devices or some other industry or video games or, you know, all those different industries, right? AMD has a lot of the chips that go into a lot of the gaming consoles. So, I mean, that was just a ridiculous question. Like, there's always a massive need for tons of other semiconductor industries because the industry is ridiculously huge. Why is NVIDIA a $2 trillion company? Well, gosh, that's a that's a tough question. Um, well, first of all, there are several things that I really appreciate about the work that we do. One, um, the foundation, the single most important instrument of humanity is computing. And now we have um, computers that uh, could uh, understand information of all different kinds. The impact so to the industries are enormous. A uh, hundred trillion dollars worth of industry are here. The impact of the work that we do 
to all these in, for okay. all these industries is absolutely incredible. You can incredible. take your two percent of the hundred trillion. Well, thank you very much. But. Now we're going. <laughs> we're going to have to toss it back to David yeah. and Sarah, and yeah. then we will speak for Mad Money tonight. Thank you, guys. Jim, thank you, uh, and thanks to Jensen as well. Fascinating. Uh, yeah, so uh, interesting interview there. Okay, next one looking forward to getting into. Here's why NVIDIA stock is trading lower. This should be very Actually, interesting. Actually, along with our own Christina Parsonevelis, who is also there at the de- developers conference. Stacy, the stock is down a little bit today. Do you yeah. think it's just, I mean, it did add a trillion dollars in market value. Hold on. Let me see where the stock's at now because this was recorded a couple hours ago. So I'm interested to see where the stock is trying out now at this point in time. It's up. It's up 896 now at this point in time. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it's all irrelevant. I mean, the stock will be 1500 before you know it. So it's all going to be irrelevant in the end. But anyways, let's get into this. What do you what do you think the market's reacting to? Look, so the, the hype into this event was was pretty massive. I've never seen anything quite like this before. I, I mean, he, he they literally sold out the S and P Center uh, yesterday. It was more reminiscent, you know, of, of a of a Taylor Swift show than than, than a than an event. Um, no, sir. Swifty would be at a stadium. Okay. So I, I think that that's it. Like, and you know, we were expecting to hear news flow on on and and specs and everything else for the for the new uh, uh, GPU uh, architecture and everything. We we heard everything that we were looking for. Oh, look at this. I like this. This is awesome. This is awesome. Wall Street Wall Street firms that have uh, over a thousand dollar price target. Bernstein thousand, Webbush thousand, Benchmark thousand, Mizuho's a thousand, thousand thousand unknown. Okay. <laughs> uh, West Park Capital a little over a thousand. Bank of America is at eleven hundred. Okay, Key Bank. 1100 truest is nearly 1200 1177 well they just want to be cool like come on man keep it in normal numbers loop capital 1200 these guys are at 1250 rosenblatt 1400 and yeah i mean if i had to put a 12 month price target i would be uh, i'd probably slap a 1500 on it Either that or 2000 if I had to put a 12-month price target. I don't know that we heard anything that we weren't necessarily expecting. It looks like a great chip. I think everybody expected that. And, and so that's why it's selling off. And frankly, the whole space is selling off today a little bit. Like, it's not actually underperforming the broader semiconductor industry. And now it's so up. I think it's just taking a little bit of a breather. Christina, what are your top Dang, takeaways? that's crazy. It's actually climbed $40 a share. Because if... It was eight ninety six, right? When I opened it, right now eight ninety six, and it was eight fifty six at this point, just a few hours ago. So forty dollars a share in a quick amount of time. Interview from from hearing Jensen from being there. Uh, well, well for just from the interview, the biggest thing right now is that he just added a price tag to the Blackwell chip. Uh, I'm waiting to confirm with the PR team for NVIDIA on which particular chip, because like you guys talked about, Blackwell is a AI platform on there. There's going to be uh, various chips uh, uh, provided over the next year or so. And so Jensen held up a Blackwell platform, and he said between thirty to $40,000, which to me... I was expecting it to be a little bit more, and I know Stacy too. I've seen his notes. Uh, a lot of analysts have weighed in, saying anywhere between forty to fifty thousand dollars, at least thirty percent higher than the previous H one hundred chip. So if that's the case, uh, it could be good for margins if demand keeps up. So that's a, a strong takeaway from yesterday. Yeah, there was a, it was a sold out event, celebrities, all of that. Uh, but I think what we did, the message that we got from Nvidia is that they're not just the hardware company; they're providing the full stack solution. Jensen just mentioned. That and that's going to make switching costs a lot harder should you choose to leave NVIDIA in a few years and go to, let's say, the in house options that a lot of mega cap tech players are, are trying to work on, <laughs> or the likes of AMD or Intel eventually, hopefully, who knows? Right, yeah, the creation of the ecosystem. Now, Stacey, do you see that as well? And how important does that become in terms of the models that you build to figure out what this company is going to be earning in years to come? Yeah, so the, the ecosystem is hugely important, right? You, you have to remember, these, they, they do everything. They do the chips. They do the hardware. They do the software. They do the networking. They do, yep. they do everything. There, there isn't a single other company on, on the planet that does They put the whole thing to together, the baby. They do everything that's around the, the chip, and it creates a tremendous amount of lock. And people have been talking about their software ecosystem. It's called CUDA. They, CUDA they, you know, they've been doing this for, for well over 10 years. Every other competitor recognizes that. Every other competitor has sort of a crash course now to try to improve their software offerings. So the problem is that you're 
fighting against a, a player that has been entrenched for over a decade. There's a massive install base that's already there. There's millions of developers yep. that can already program on NVIDIA's platforms. It's a very, very um, a broad moat that is very hard to crack. And I think most of the other players out there are discovering that. Yeah. Uh, Stacey, uh, just something I'd love you to be able to explain to me and our viewers. How so let me tell you a big mistake everybody's making in regards to AMD and NVIDIA. Okay? Big mistake. And I've seen so many people making this mistake. So many people have been buying AMD stock because they're like, oh, AMD is going to catch up to NVIDIA and all these sorts of things. The best alpha, likely, if you're going to compare NVIDIA and AMD, it's likely still NVIDIA. Just because AMD has a cheaper share price does not mean uh, it's, a, it's a better opportunity, it's a better deal in the market. You can look at the forward P's of those companies and you can look at the growth rates of those companies, right? And it's clear as day, NVIDIA is decimating AMD, like in a massive way. Look at AMD's growth rates over this past year. Look at NVIDIA. Like NVIDIA's winning the battle and they're winning the war. That's the thing you got to understand about this. That doesn't mean there's not a place for AMD. But if you want to think, people are thinking AMD is going to outperform NVIDIA over the coming years. And I'm like, I don't think so. It looks to me like 100% NVIDIA is winning the battle and they're winning the war in the end. And so I think that's just a little food for thought. Just because one share price is more expensive than the other does not mean the other one's a better opportunity. Okay, And so I just think that's a big mistake that a lot of folks are making out there that maybe don't understand exactly what's going on right now. Consumption, because we've talked about it a lot sort of in the broader context of data centers. But I know the introduction of this platform was accompanied by saying that it uh, consumes a lot less power for more computing. I, but explain really what's going on here, because I, I got a little bit lost. Yeah, no, so on a per workload basis, every architecture that they introduce is, is much more efficient. And I think they said something it could be as much as 25 times the efficiency of, of operating. Take those with a grain of salt. I mean, I mean, like, fine, they're, they're going to throw out, you know, like good big numbers. But it should be more efficient on a per workload basis. On an absolute basis, though, these things do use a lot of power because you're cramming more and more compute into these data centers, and so you're actually dragging a lot more power on an absolute basis into these. It actually is like something that, that may become an issue, like broadly for the space. Like, how do you get the absolute amount of power that's required into these data centers to do the compute? But given the amount of compute that they're doing with them on, on a per workload basis, much more efficient, um, uh, much more cost effective uh, with, with, every, with every generation. So we need to get the power in there, though. Alrighty, next one up here, NVIDIA unveils Blackwell, what you need to know. Developers conference is underway, CEO Jensen Wong uh, unveiling the next generation of AI chips to a packed house at the SAP Center in San Jose yesterday. Hopper is fantastic, but we need bigger GPUs. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce you to a very very big GPU. <laughs> that is pretty funny. <laughs> this is Hopper. Hopper changed the world. This is Blackwell. Told you. Uh, and it, 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 actually, the guy's name is David Harold Blackwell, uh, a mathematician. It wasn't uh, Richard Blackwell, the fashionista, but... Um, you can see it. It's a GPU that has all kinds of advantages in terms of, of performance and uh, energy usage. And already, anybody who's anybody is going to get this new line upgrade from Hopper. Um, Cisco, Dell, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, uh, Lenovo, Supermicro, all plan to deliver service based on uh, the Blackwell lineup NVIDIA added. Our next guest is a tech investor who might actually understand this. Uh, he owns invest, uh, NVIDIA and joins us now. Paul Meeks is co-chief investment officer at Harvest Portfolio Management and finance professor uh, at the Citadel for Lehman. Uh, and I, I don't know what you are, Paul. You got an engineering degree or a math, uh, mathematics uh, degree. What, what, what can you can you make this easy for uh, for every well for our viewers to understand? I mean, obviously, Becky and I are totally up to, to speed on this. But can you just uh, make it easier for people that may not be as as uh, in the loop as us? What's going on? No, I'll tell you, Joe. Before the commercial break, you went through the specs and you were sounding pretty nerdy. So I, <laughs> I like what you got. But I'll tell you this: so it's a, a larger physical uh, GPU. 
It actually uses two dye, which is a very sophisticated manufacturing technique from Taiwan Semiconductor. And you think about it, it's going to provide about 5x the performance of the latest H100 hopper chip. And so essentially more and more horsepower. They're making a bet that there's going to be a never ending uh, desire for these chips as we continue to build out these large language models. And so we'll see what happens. You know, uh, in about three hours today, they're going to have a, a meeting for a Wall Street analyst like me, and we'll be able to hopefully get some guidance as to the financial impact. Because even though the specs here, ooh, that's important. That's important. Listen, Nvidia head Wall Street analysts at what sounds like a closed door meeting. Interesting. And then Nvidia stock ended up going up a bunch. So maybe based upon suddenly what those Wall Streeter folks heard, they liked what they heard and they said back to their clients, buy, buy, buy. Because all of a sudden that stock went up massively right after that Wall Street analyst meeting would have happened, right? Hmm. Hmm. Interesting how that works, right? They must have heard some things they liked. Are pretty impressive. <clears throat> now, they already have about 90% market share in the chips, the GPUs are building large language models. And so maybe this brings a greater profitability, but they essentially already own the pie. And so what they announced yesterday, I thought that was pretty snappy. A lot bigger. Next, we can get into the NIM software that they also announced. But what we need to hear is for them to keep their technology lead specifically over advanced micro devices. And at least last night or yesterday afternoon, I think they checked those boxes, which they needed to check because, of course, the stock is up fivefold since the introduction of ChatGPT a couple of years ago. Well, better margins or better profits on a stock that a lot of people say is not that expensive relative to other technology stocks. That, that's pretty. That's not bad. The stock was off a little bit, but that that could just be uh, that could just be, you know, the run up was 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 so significant. Right. Uh, what the, 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 you said? Software. They're also uh, yeah. Talking about so the Oliver's next stage, enterprise digital. To there, there is more than just the the Blackwell uh, that new technology that was uh, introduced, wasn't there? What else? That's right. So in tandem, they offered uh, software for inference. Now, in the AI supply chain, you start with your large language model building, and that's what's going to uh, continue to probably happen for another year or so. And then you take all of that uh, great data that you've crunched and you try to create some patterns that actually can be used by folks. And so what they want to do is make sure, since they already own the pie for large language model building, that they keep their lead in the next stage inference. So they announced NIM software, NIM. And what this will do is they are going to charge uh, about $4,500 per GPU per year as a license fee to better be able to use their chips in this uh, inference stage, which is the next stage of AI. Now, the price point is not going to drive revenue like the chips did. But the nice thing about the software licensing model is there are no manufacturing costs. It's 100% gross margin so pound for pound it'll be much more profitable i mean that's, it's, that's it's a big a deal one, i thought a, Paul. a one-two punch that was necessary yeah i, I mean that just the idea that they're going to be so much more than just a chip maker um right. the idea that you could uh, i guess become more like a microsoft or somebody with the, with the software aspects to that 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 changes the equation i guess to some extent and the, the profitability of this company yeah, Becky, that's a great point. So what they're trying to do is become the AI ecosystem, kind of like uh, Apple so successfully did with the walled garden, right? You had to have the phone and the watch and the earbuds. So <laughs> this is what NVIDIA is trying to do here. Airpods, build a sir. walled garden ecosystem in AI <clears throat> that'll be durable for many years that doesn't just include 
uh, several iterations of the fastest GPUs, but also software and probably other products over time in that bundle. So they're trying to copy that Apple walled garden playbook. Yeah. And, you know, that's why it feels a little bit, uh, you know, it feels a little bit Apple 2009-ish, right? 2010 maybe even, right? Uh, iPhone just starting to really ramp up. Numbers start pouring in. People are like, well, how big can this really get? And, you know, everybody's trying to figure that out. And that kind of feels like in video right now, right? Already next one up here, tremendous amount of cash on the sideline. Business, 2023, yeah. you added a record 37K net new clients. That's up 50% versus the prior year. Where has that business come from? Yeah, it's a great question. We, we've seen tremendous interest in clients working with financial advisors. We chalk that up to a couple things, John. We look at the pace of wealth creation in this country, which is accelerating. It's, it's, um, it's really doubled when you look at U.S. household financial assets for wealth management in the last 10 years. Uh, we, again, we don't see that slowing down. You see the wealth transfer, the great wealth transfer. It's not going to happen. It's happening now. And the world's becoming more complex, not less. So all that backdrop really leads to more and more clients realizing the value and the need for professional financial advice delivered by a human being. The, that's our FAs, that's our uh, financial advisors. Yeah, the human being aspect of that's important. Yeah. We might return to that a little bit later in the conversation. Can you talk to us yeah. about the nature of that money? Where's that money gone? Is it just sort of cash funds? Yeah. People sitting there, money market funds, taking 5% and sleeping well at night? What is it? Good question. Um, you know, we've seen a shift. Um, no. Prior to the fourth quarter of last year, we did see our cash balances really grow, um, really to a level that was three times prior to the current rate, uh, rate hike, uh, hike cycle. Um, we started in the fourth quarter seeing that cash move off the sidelines. Where is it going? It's going into a couple different places. You see it moving into equities and fixed income. Um, our clients tend to move into our professionally managed portfolios, either by Chris Heisey and our CIO team, um, or all the separately managed accounts we offer on our platform to clients. So you see it going into equities. You see clients last year, especially in the back half of the year, lock in yields. Um, we saw a lot of bond ladders. And then you're seeing alternative um, like investments as well. So we're seeing clients, and it's got to be a certain type of client, but you're seeing clients wanting access to private markets as well as public. And our AI assets have doubled in the past five years. I just am wondering, just going back to where is the money coming from, is it all the same households that are just building their wealth and then able to mm. come to you? Or is this actually a broadening net where people are earning more and able to invest a greater proportion of... I like that question, but before we <clears throat> get into that, I just think it's important everybody understands if... You know, you're so yeah, if you're one of those that's always worried about crash, recession, these sorts of things, right? Which can crop up into your mind over time. I think this is one of the more comforting feelings in the market in terms of just there's so much money out there right now that's just sitting around. That if real estate drops in any substantial way, there's so much money ready to rock and roll, right? If stocks drop in any considerable way, there's so much money ready to rock and roll. And so I just think that's a little level of comfort out there that, you know, we, you don't always have that. And we do have that at the moment, right? Three years from now, that could be different. Five years from now, that could be different. But for right now, we certainly got it. Assets. I think it's both. Um, you know, there is a lot of wealth creation that still is happening. Businesses are continuing to be sold. Um, liquidity is being generated. Wealth is being transferred between generations. You look at baby boomers, which control half of the wealth. That's ages 59 to 77. Um, that's an age demographic where money's not going to transfer. It's starting to transfer. It already is. Um, so you're seeing all the above. In, in transfer, you know, just to put it as bluntly as possible, is people passing on, right? And then that money uh, going to their kids. So somebody's got, their parents have a half million dollars, right? And, uh, you know, the parents pass on and the money goes to the kids or whatever, right? And so that's what we're talking about there. And then all of a sudden the kids' net worth just grew uh, a lot. And then those kids might be a little more uh, likely to spend the money. Also, I think another factor to, to consider is, you know, baby boomers, a lot of them are, are you know, living life right now. And so, a lot of baby boomers are going to be spending a lot of money in this economy over the next couple decades here, okay? Because a lot of baby boomers are, you know, in their 60s right now, and 
they've got a pretty good amount of money behind them. They're going to be wanting to go on a lot of vacations and cruises and all those sorts of things and go out to eat and all that stuff. So you're going to see a lot of money spent from the baby boomer generation over this next decade or two. And obviously the government's having to continue to up Social Security as well. So that's a little factor, you know, to, to keep in mind as far as all that goes. So, um, yeah, you know, that's is very bullish, I would say, for... Uh, I think travel companies is in restaurants or some of the two that come to mind that are just kind of two of the most direct beneficiaries of kind of the baby boomer generation. Um, you know, getting to a place where they're retiring, they've got good money behind them and they're going to spend that money. And it's certainly not all of them, but let's say it's, you know, 40%, 30%. Um, that's a lot of money behind them. Um, and that's, and those are all the clients that we can serve. The reason why I ask this is because I think about uh, sort of this idea that consumers have locked in benchmark rates if they have yeah. mortgages, if they already have bought a house. They aren't paying that much more in interest, but they're earning much more, not only in interest mm -hmm. from uh, even short-term instruments, but also from an equity market that's doing just fine. Mm -hmm. So this is where it comes from that easy financial conditions, that yep. basically <laughs> these are consumers that have much more spending capacity. Yep. How much is that sort of possible to continue? How much do you see that as like sort of a, a, something that has legs? Listen, we still see a tremendous amount of cash on the, on the sidelines. I think that's come up here earlier in the program. Um, so that money is going to get put to work. Um, you know, we look at that money, you know, like I said, as of the fourth quarter, we see that money moving into our fee-based platforms. At a really this is where I would push back against her. We'll see that money get, get put to work. I, I'm not so sure. You know, I, I think a lot of that money is going to stay on the sidelines. I think if you get any sort of big drop in the stock market or a big drop in the real estate market, then maybe we could talk. Or if rates get cut, slashed in, in a huge way and you're not making that much money for having that money on the sidelines, then maybe it comes in the market. But, um, yeah, I'd push back against that there. Great. We're on pace um, to well exceed last year what we saw. Um, and, and look, it, it's really client by client. So in our business and wealth management, no client is created equal. Um, our financial advisors work with our clients, figure out liquidity needs, how much money do they have to have on the sidelines, how much money do they really should they put to work, what's their risk tolerance, their time horizon, yep. um, their comfort level with risk, what are their growth projections, and all that is done in a financial planning context. And most of our clients are asset allocated. Um, most of our clients have a well-diversified portfolio across equities, fixed income, some alternatives as well. And then cash has become an asset class again. So, you know, there is a piece of your day-to-day -day operating cash, and there often is a piece where if we've got a little money, we can wait, we can earn, pre you know, pretty decent yields. We go to bath. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's risk on several different sides, right? Imagine you're only in the SP 500, say you get an 8% return, let's say inflation's running at 3%, well, then you're actually making, let's say, 5% really there, versus if I can be in individual stocks and I can get a much bigger gain than that, 15 or 20%, then I put myself in much of a, you know, safer place, right? So, um, but of course, not everybody's willing to put in the research work and do all the study and understand everything that you got to understand when picking individual stocks. So then that might be too risky for them. So then it's back to SP 500. Some other people might say, I don't want to be in the stock market. That's too risky. Uh, just have me in CD accounts or savings accounts or things like that, right? So it's really person by person. All right, guys, appreciate you joining me. Much love as always. Pin comment down there. Brand new free workshop for you guys. How much money you need to retire, quit your job, focus full time on investing. Those sorts of subjects are all covered in that. It's about a 20, 25 minute video. They'll be pinned comment down there. Much love and have a great day.